What up, Wizards? It's Dev and the boys over here. Yes, I'm wearing the same shirt as yesterday. Counterpoint, shut up. I got bigger things to worry about, you know? These foundation previews keep pouring in, even though we didn't get quite as many as we got yesterday. We still got a few cards to look at. And I guess not having as many cards from foundations to look at today means that we can kind of focus on some other stuff, too, at the end of the video. You know, we'll look at, like, three cards from the Jumpstart set that I really like, I want to take note of, and then three cards from Ether Drift that we got to see yesterday. That's the... Everyone calls it the Fast and the Furious set, or the Pod Racing set, or the Need for Speed set, or the Speed Racer set, or whatever. I'm going to call it the Initial D set, and I think that'll help me like it a little bit more. But yeah, we saw three cards from that yesterday. Haven't gotten a chance to look at them on camera yet. Let's do it! A lot of fun stuff to do today, and a lot of cards to look at when it's all said and done, so let's stop wasting each other's time and get to it. Now, let's start today with some reprints, just like we did yesterday, although not anywhere near as many. <laughs> Only three reprints came out today, but none of them are particularly impressive, if you ask me, and you did, you clicked on the video, so... Here's my opinion. We saw things like Blanchwood Armor, originally printed in Urza's Saga. That's a powerful set, but this card's not too great on its own. <laughs> you know, it was printed in like five different core sets up to now, so I guess this counts as the sixth one. Blanchwood Armor seems cool and might be like, okay, in mono green draft or something, but it's just not that great. Never has been, even though it is kind of a cool, like, Timmy-like card. But apart from that, we saw a Tally Primal Storm. That's a rare reprint right there. This is a six-mana guy that when you attack with him, you got to wait to attack. And then you get free spells off your library and off your opponent's library. Basically, the Tally that's seven mana and has been in standard for a while already uh, is just a better version of this. I know it costs, like, a mana more, but it just does the thing when it enters play, and that's, like, infinitely better. But my favorite reprint of the day was Angel of Finality. This was originally printed in, like, Commander 2013, and it's been printed in a bunch of Commander products up to now, but never into Standard. We finally get it, and it's technically downshifted to Uncommon now, which I like. I don't want to open this as a rare, so thanks for that, Wizards. But it's actually kind of interesting, man. Just a 4-mana, 3-4 Flying Angel, and when it enters the battlefield, you exile someone's graveyard. That's actually kind of saucy. There's a few decks in Standard this works against. There's a bunch of Reanimator Piles and Oculus, which I guess is just a Reanimator Pile. But there's a few decks that play out of their graveyard in one way or another in Standard. So the idea of just wiping their yard and having a 3-4 flyer they have to contend with, actually slightly attractive, although I fear the card is like a little bit too expensive to play in Standard. But we saw way more new stuff than old stuff today, which I've got to admit I kind of like. So let's take a look at that mess, starting with Vampire Gourmet, as well as Claws Out over here. Now, Vampire Gourmet, he only eats delicious people, so if it tastes bad, you don't have to worry about him. He's just two mana, one on the black for a 2-2 vampire. Whenever this creature attacks, you may sacrifice another creature. If you do, draw a card, and this creature can't be blocked this turn. Now, I kind of really want to like this guy, but I just can't quite bring myself to because you got to compare him to all the other stuff in the two drop slot of like sacrifice decks right now and see, does he really make the cut compared to that stuff? What do you cut to put this guy in the deck? I'm just not too sure. But on the other hand, he is a guaranteed sacrifice outlet every single turn at least once. But if you wanted to be cynical, you or a realist, really, you could probably just say that that is only once per turn, right? I understand that, but he's pretty good at getting you a card every turn, guaranteed two damage when he gets through, so I don't know. I kind of like the dude a little bit. Aristocrats doesn't have a whole lot of ways to draw cards right now, and if I really wanted to be silly, I could compare this to Bob, you know, like Dark Confidant or something. Like, well, it's a two-drop guy that draws you a card every turn, <laughs> right? But in this case, you got to come down on board presence to do it. But there's a lot of kind of attractive ways to do that. You got little one-drop nerds like Clockwork Percussionist and Greedy Freebooter and Market Gnome, like plenty of things this guy wants to eat, you know? So I don't know. At the end of the day, I want to build Aristocrat, so I'm probably going to cook with the dude, but I'm just not sure he gets to eat. But Claw's out over here. Let's look at this thing, man. You probably already know I'm into this if you skipped ahead and read the card already while I was running my butt liquor back there. But yeah, Claw's out is pretty sick. This is five mana, three and two white, sort of, for an instant. This costs one less to cast for each cat you control. And creatures you control get plus two, plus two until end of turn. So it actually costs two mana, like every single time you cast it, I assume. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it costs three some of the time because you got two cats in play, but yeah, this is for the most part going to cost a couple of mana and come out of nowhere on offense or on defense and probably win you the game either way. This is actually a really, really nice piece of like anthem kind of, you know, not quite an anthem, but a pump spell for all your dudes at lightning fast speed in the middle of combat is definitely awesome. So I like this, man. We just saw a cat yesterday that costs three mana. He's a legend and he puts another cat into play when he enters play. 
So there's a couple of cats right there. Plus there's stuff like Cutzel's Flanker and Cutzel himself, Nine Lives Familiar is in the set, and a few other decent cats that are in standard right now. So I guess we're going to have to try to make it. I think that almost like no matter how bad the cats are leading up to this, if you just attack with like four or five cats, you probably win the game if you can cast this. So I don't know, man. I'm kind of really into it, although... I admit that it's not perfect, but if you get it right, it could be a catastrophe for your opponent. I'm going to stop. We got to move on to other cards and do puns about them, but that said, I hate to disappoint you. I don't have a whole lot of puns about Sun Blessed Healer, but I can make up for that by telling you this is just a solid little duder, man. He's two mana, one and a white for a 3-1 human cleric with lifelink, and you can kick him for one and a white. So if you pay an extra couple of mana when you cast this spell, he's going to enter the battlefield and return a non-land permanent card from your yard. Uh, with mana value two or less to the battlefield. So that's actually kind of slick, dude. The first few times I read this card, I was like, oh yeah, he returns a creature. Autocomplete. It just happens in my head, right? But you actually read through the card and read every word of it like you should, then it says non-land permanent. And now we're kind of talking a little bit, starts being able to get back like hopeless nightmares and certain like talents, right? Like if you lost your scavenger's talent or your innkeeper's talent or your case of the uneaten feast, that's not even a talent, it's a case. But, you know, there's a few things that if you played them in the early game as enchantments, Lunar Convocation, Up the Beanstalk, right? There's plenty of like two mana enchantments especially and even artifacts that you might get back with your healer. So that's cool. But if you want to be just annoying in draft, I guess one copy of this gets back another copy. Copy, so that's kind of funny. One more, uh, probably not actually as quick as I want it to be thing about this card. You guys know if you've been with the channel for a while, I play a lot of Elso Core, man. I try to make some aristocrats or sacrifice decks work in like every single format, and they're really tough to make work. And just like Vampire Gourmet, I'm just not sure this has the quality it needs to to actually make the two drop slot or the four drop slot really in an aristocrats deck, unless that deck is pretty life gain focused. But there are a lot of cool things this does in a potential aristocrat deck. Every time I play an Illicil Core or a Vron on turn two, they instantly eat a cut down or a go for the throat or a get lost or something like that. So it'd be nice to have this to get those like really important two drops back into place. Bartolome is another good example, but in the life gain decks, this is pretty decent too. You know, it has lifelink, so it triggers your essence channelers and your Amalias and your Johnny's Pride Mates, which are in this set, but also gets them back from the yard after they, again, eat that like inevitable Doomblade effect. So it's actually kind of really tempting to try to make this work as well in Aristocrats because you'll always have something to do with it. But now let's look at my pick for most interesting card of the day. I really like this thing. It's Midnight Snack. This is three mana, two and a black for an enchantment with Raid. So at the beginning of your end step, if you attacked this turn, create a food token. And for two and a black, you can sack this enchantment and target opponent loses X life or X is the amount of life you gained this turn. Okay, so speaking of life gain decks, a lot of those have flying creatures, like Life Creed Duo, right, obviously, some of them play Ruin Lurker Bat, they obviously almost all play Zorline, Essence Chandler can get flying, so pretty easy to get through with creatures, right, so... That means you'll be attacking a good bit, and if you do that, you'll be getting food off of this. But the food every turn isn't even really the thing that intrigues me about this, obviously. It's a sacrifice ability. You know, even like one lifelink creature, and imagine this, in like a black-white enchantment deck, I'm not sure how good this potentially is, but just the idea of like loading something up with an ethereal armor and a couple of enchantments in play, and then playing like Sheltered by Ghosts, on that guy and getting through for like seven lifelink damage and ending the game by sacrificing midnight snack like that's feasible you know so i like that but again back to these life game decks we've seen in standard i think they could leverage this pretty well too because they pretty routinely gain anywhere between like a bolt and a lava axe worth of damage you know of life every single turn so you know even if you only hit with like one lifelink creature and it does three damage an extra bolt might be all you need to put the game away but there's definitely like outlier turns where you gain like eight life in those decks and then suddenly you can end the game with midnight snacks so again this is another one i have to like qualify and say i'm not sure that it makes the cut it's a little cumbersome it's six total mana to get to do the thing and you know it takes a turn to play it so hopefully you get some sort of eerie effect when you do play it but altogether man there are definitely like powerful i was gonna say just like interesting but truly like actually objectively powerful things about this card you know we've got stuff like enduring vitality is that the name of the card i don't know that's 
It's endearing tenacity <laughs> in standard. And even with some of the other cards we saw yesterday from Foundations, there is a potential life gain deck like shaping up in standard. And cards like this look kind of dangerous in those decks. So again, I'm not like super into the raid effect. I think that's very slow value. But if you untap with this in play and get through with like one decently sized lifelink guy, you can probably win the game. So I like this enchantment an awful lot. Maybe a little bit too awkward, but I'm a big fan. This one gets to eat. They did, in fact, cook with this one. More food puns. But anyway, let's look at Fire Spitter Whelp next. This is one of the last few cards of the day that's brand new from Foundations. But I think this one is going to get a lot of people excited, myself included, man. This is three mana, two and a red for a 2-2 two -two dragon with flying. Whenever you cast a non-creature or dragon spell, this creature deals one damage to each opponent. Okay, so it's one of these, right? Like sort of a gutter snipe a little bit. We just lost one or two of these to rotation, and I was kind of missing them. <laughs> I just love red creatures that do this. But in this case, it's not just non-creature spells. Some of these creatures like this will just say instant or sorcery. This says non-creature. I think that's pretty cool. So you play a planeswalker, an enchantment, an artifact, whatever. You get the pings for that. I like pings, but you also get it when you just curve into another dragon on the next turn, which is also six. So it's just a wind drake with upside, right? A three mana two two flyer, but that upside is pretty sick if you can get it to trigger even like a, a couple of times. So, and with any like panharmonicon effects or anything that doubles up the triggers or just any way to play a ton of instant and sorcery spells, you know, there's a ton of ways to abuse this, but I do think the casting cost again is like a little bit too much for an effect like this. It'll gives you the one ping you want to get multiple copies of it out but again that's super awkward you're not really doing anything to like turn five if you do that so i'm just not like again super sure that this is like very very playable but it probably goes in like every dragon's deck or commander dragon's deck for the end of time at this point because not only does it trigger off lightning strikes but you've got you know 30 plus dragons in your deck that this triggers too and it's a three drop and there's just not a ton of playable three drop dragons throughout magic history so just to fill out your curve you'll probably play it in Commander. So it's uh, probably exciting there. But again, in those Commander decks where you just want gutter snipe effects and stuff like that, thermo alchemist effects, then like this guy probably finds a slot too. So he's got a home and a couple of decks in EDH, but I just think he's a little too slow for standard at this casting cost, but I cannot wait to be proven wrong. The dude is cool. We'll move on to a mythic, and you believe it? It's Valkyrie's Call right here. Five mana, three and two white for an enchantment. Whenever a non-angel, non-token creature you control dies, return it to the battlefield under its owner's control with a plus one, plus one counter on it. It has flying and is an angel in addition to its other types. Pretty gross magic card, I gotta admit, but again, this kind of has the like corset disease where it costs too much. <laughs> Are we really going to play this? in standard because from a spike perspective hate to do it but here we go this is a five mana do nothing and it sucks and i hate it. it's too slow <laughs> like they're probably they're that wolf that lives inside of me is probably kind of right when it comes to like standard playability but it does remind me of a luminous brood moth which is not a good argument for standard playability because that card didn't see all the play that it deserved to that card's great but Luminous Broodmoth has definitely seen a new life in Commander since it rotated out of Standard. And I'm pretty sure that's where this card belongs too, but that's not a slight. I'm not trying to like make fun of it or anything. That's a good place to belong because there's a lot of Commander games played. This is a slick card in those decks, but especially in like decks that get some value out of playing an enchantment like I don't know, Enchantress <laughs> seems seems pretty good because your Enchantress dies, it comes back with a plus one plus one counter and it flies. And you drew a card when this came into play from all your enchantresses. Ah, oh, that's good. So, kind of want to play it there. Does it replace Sigil of the Empty Throne? I'll just play them both. Why can't I just play all the five drops I want to? What's magic? But speaking of angles over here, we also saw Exemplar of Light today. Four mana, two and two white for a 3-3 three, three flying angel. Whenever you gain life, put a plus one, plus one counter on this man. Lady, this creature, it says this creature. <laughs> just read the card, Dev. Whenever you put one or more plus one, plus one counters on this creature... Draw a card. This ability triggers only once each turn. Oh, you're going to put a Dusk Legion Duelist on a Johnny's Pride Maid, and it costs exactly as much as if you smash those two cards together and made them kiss. Four mana kind of seems like a lot. You know, that's a little bit much, but I guess if you have a case of the Uneaten Feast or some other thing like that in play, it enters play as a 4-4, and you draw a card, like, immediately, and that seems like we're kind of getting somewhere, dude. Like, if this is a 5-5 on the first turn, it can actually swing in. 
then I think that you are doing well. I have some hopes for this, although they're not like incredibly high hopes, but they're slightly higher hopes than all the other cards that we've looked at today. I don't think anything we've looked at today is strictly terrible, like a, just a bad magic card. I think they're all kind of interesting, which is why I've been able to run my yapper so much about them all and like extend the runtime of this video as much as I have. So I think there is like, there are legitimately interesting things to say about all the cards we've looked at today. And this is definitely, I think, in some ways, the most powerful of all of them, even giving the kind of like not great, you know, like rate here. Four mana for a three three is not really where you want to be, but it does everything the life game deck wants to do and didn't already do in terms of like drawing cards. It wants that. So I don't know, dude. I'm going to try it, and I would not be surprised if it was actually pretty good. I just did the reload, and there's nothing new so far on Mythic Spoiler or MTG Previews or any of the sites. So I guess what I want to do before we get out of here is look at three cards from the Jumpstart set. We haven't seen the whole thing or anything, but there are three that like really caught my eye and I want to talk about for just a second. And then we'll talk about three Ether Drift cards that we got to look at. That's the next set, I guess, coming out 2025, February 2025. So... We see so we saw some cards from it. That's kind of exciting. Let's take a look at these things, starting with the Jumpstart cards. Now here first is General Crete, the Bolt Bringer. I really like this, but I do want to stress up front here that none of these Jumpstart cards are legal and standard, but you can play them in Commander or your cubes and stuff like that. And I just really like the look of a few of these, and I wanted to share them with you. So Bro the Bolt Bringer here is three mana, two and a red for a 2-2 two -two legendary Goblin Soldier. Whenever one or more goblins you control attack, create a 1-1 one -one red goblin creature token that's tapped and attacking. Whenever another creature you control enters, General Crete the Bolt Bringer deals one damage to each opponent. So neither one of these two abilities are anything that we haven't seen before, right? Like one is a uh, guy. He's a guy. There's like three different goblins that do this at this point, but it kind of rem reminiscent of Rabble Master or something. Um, the second ability is Impact Trimmers, and I'm actually kind of excited to have that for three mana in the command zone. Awesome guy here, and I imagine that there's definitely turns where if you have like five, six open mana, you can do like nasty, filthy stuff with him the turn he comes out. So kind of excited about him. I don't play all the commander in the world, but he does have me excited to build him on a red deck. But we also got to look at Scythe Cat Cub from the Jumpstart set. This is two mana, one and a green for a 2-2 cat with Lample. Lample. <laughs> He's got Trample, but also Landfall. That's Lample. Uh, but anyway, the Landfall ability here is whenever a land you control enters, put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature you control. If this is the second time this ability is resolved this turn, double the number of plus one, plus one counters on that creature instead. So just a better Bristly Bill. You know, it doesn't have the Bristly Bill activated ability, but still, you know... <laughs> It's basically better, especially given that it's not legendary. You can have multiple in play. So ultimately, it's just a sweet card to have access to in landfall decks. One of the better landfall pieces in a while when you think about it. You know, even if it's just redundancy with Bristly Bill, you're going to throw it in that commander deck. And oh my goodness, when you pop that fetch land, dude, it's going to go off all the way. Like double the number of plus one, plus one counters on a guy is actually unconscionable. Why is it there? It's too powerful. Seriously, but... Anyway, we got one more of these Jumpstart cards to look at today. It is Hinterland Sanctifier. This is just one mana for a 1-2 Rabbit Cleric. Whenever another creature you control enters, you gain one life. Why is this not in the main set? It still has a chance to be in the main set, right? Just because it's in Jumpstart doesn't mean it's not in the main set. Maybe they'll swerve us and they'll throw this in, but... I just don't know, man. This seems like the kind of thing that was in the main set, and they're like, yeah, let's put it in the Jumpstart product after they decided it might be too good for standard. I know it's just like Lunark Veteran. We just had that card. It just left. But I do think they're worried a little bit about like overjuicing the life gain decks because they really did get a lot of toys recently, and they've got some new stuff in this set, as we've just seen. So maybe they're worried about giving white, like, you know, eight one drops, basically a case of the uneaten feast. And now this that, um, actually do the thing on turn one, go ahead and lock this ability into place. Cause it's such an important ability for life gain decks. But again, I will, I will sit here on my couch and judge them and call them cowards for not letting us have this in standard. I would have really liked to, but for what it's worth, you know, in, in commander, you now have yet another soul sister, a redundant effect with souls attendant and souls, soul warden and impassioned order and life creed duo. And like all the cards that do this for one or two mana, there's a million of them now. And you'll probably play, especially all the one drop ones. Essence warden is another one. Just, 
You'll play all the one drop ones in those life gain commander decks, and this dude is definitely making the cut. But now I guess I just get to be really happy when they do end up printing it into standard. It's not too late, Wizards. Anyway, let's take a look at these Ether Drift cards. This again is the initial D. We're gonna be drifting, baby. It's even it's even got drift in the name. So Night of Fire running in the 90s, which so deja vu. Let's just break out the initial D playlist and do some driving, baby. Anyway. Oh, that sounds fun. But anyway, we're looking at the race car, racing cars set. We got to see three pieces from it the other day, and they all look at least, you know, kind of neat. The Two of them look kind of neat, and then the other one actually looks reasonably powerful. So I guess that means we start with the neat stuff, like Earth Rumbler right here. This is a vehicle. Get it? We're doing race cars. This is five mana, four and a green for a seven, six vehicle with vigilance and trample. <laughs> Exile an artifact or creature card from your graveyard. This vehicle becomes an artifact creature until end of turn. And you can also make it an artifact creature by crewing it the traditional way for just three. But this actually is slightly maybe better than it looks while not being great at all. In fact, um, <laughs> I wish this hit any graveyard. That would be much juicier. But I will say, just having like a five mana scaled worm with abilities, you know, shout out to Ice Edge, one of my favorite arts of all time. But anyway, a 7 6 with two diff de decent keywords. I seriously, trample on a seven power guy. Let's kind of go, right? So I don't think this is a bad rate for this dude at all. Uh, and he's relatively easy to crew. You should have. Um, in your graveyard <laughs> to crew this with. So I don't hate it, but five mana is probably, you know, just think of what you could be spending five mana on. And I think you'd probably do better than this. So I'll move on to Duretti, Rocketeer Engineer right here. This is five mana, four and a red for a star five legendary goblin artificer. Its power is equal to the greatest mana value among artifacts you control. When Duretti, whenever Duretti enters or attacks, choose an artifact card in your yard. You may sacrifice an artifact. If you do, return the chosen card to the battlefield. So that means Duretti's power is always going to be nine because you're always going to be getting a portal to Phyrexia back from your graveyard. In that situation, I assume, right? Like, swing in with Duretti, sacrifice a treasure or clue token or something like that. Get back portal. They sack three dudes. You get in for nine. Let's freaking go. Like, that just seems like a powerful play. Uh, but you have to give Duretti haste to make him, like, really good. And there's not all the ways in standard of making that happen the turn that you play him on curve. It's a fairly unique effect, even in standard, where I think you can do powerful stuff beyond even portal to Phyrexia. Get back Chime Ill, the Inner Sun, or, like, something cool like that with with it get back you know might stone and weak stone and draw two cards or minus five minus five that guy get through for five like all seem like pretty decent lines to me so i you know kind of excited to try and cook with the dude but the most just like obviously powerful card that we got to see out of these three is bright glass gear hulk here this is four mana two green and two white for a four four artifact creature it is a construct with first strike and trample so four mana four four first strike trample all right when this creature enters you may search your library for up to two artifact creature and or enchantment cards with mana value one or less reveal them put them into your hand and then shuffle Oh my god, that <laughs> seems okay, dude. Like, I get two cards when this comes into play, and yeah, it kind of seems like it wants you to play an overabundance of one-drops, which you may or may not want to do in your deck, but there's plenty of powerful one-drops. Not just in Standard, although Standard, sure, but obviously in Commander, I think that this, this goes and gets your Soul Ring, first of all, but there's plenty of other things this can just go and snag for you, man. Honestly, the rate is fine alone, and in Standard, he can't be go for the throated, he can't be cut down, he can't be bolted. That toughness really matters in the creature type, or the card type artifact in this case really matters too so a lot of things i like about this even if he does somehow die to a removal spell the turn he comes out he got you two cards and yeah the mana value is not great on him but he still put two cards into your hand that's great dude so what are you what are you wailing about over there <laughs> this guy's actually kind of fantastic and there's plenty of good stuff you can do and again i'm mostly speaking on standard here but in commander a thing that tutors two one drops two one drops of nearly any important card type. Come on, man. This guy's amazing. That is Alski Kowalski. I just did a whole reload on Mythic Spoiler again, and they're just not gonna not gonna give us any more new cards today, although they're supposed to. They're scheduled to be like four more people that put out previews today, but maybe they live on the other side of the world or something. It's like they're over there like, I'm gonna release this at noon, my time. And it's like, okay, it's like three o'clock in the morning, my time sucks. But still, we should get some more cards today at some point, which means that I'll have more cards to cover 
tomorrow. So win-win, right? I guess just let me know how you felt about all the stuff from today. Even the ether drift stuff. If you got opinions, I want to know them, baby. I know a lot of people making fun of that set, but I kind of want to do a whole video defending it, even though it hasn't come out yet. I like racing cars. <laughs> <laughs> and apart from that, to all the YouTube stuff on your way out, here comes the pitch, baby. Hit you right down the middle. Just uh, do the hit the button that's shaped like a thumb down there. You can tell the button I'm talking about because it's shaped like a thumb. Uh, but that's basically all I got for this one. <laughs> just any thoughts and opinions, throw them at me. Just toss them at me. Lob them unless you want to just hurl them. You, whatever you want to do, put me in the stockade and hit me with that tomato. I love you all. I'm dead from the place. Thanks for watching, Wizards. Spread love and be kind.